Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Source Bio International PLC Investor Presentation for the half year results for the year ended um, 2021. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Simply type in your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question received during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard and you'll be notified once these are ready for your review. I'd also like to remind you this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Jayla Q, Executive Chairman and Tony Ratcliffe, CFO of Source Bio International. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I'm, I'm Jay Q. I'm the executive chairman of Source Bioscience. I joined uh, as a non-exec chair in 2016 uh, and became uh, chairman uh, and CEO in 2017. I've got significant experience with UK listed life science companies, uh, generally more of an early stage commercial, building them up and, uh, and growing them into profitable entities. I was executive commercial director of BioQual PLC recently before the acquisition by Ecolab. I was CEO of Celsius International PLC from 2000 until 2009 until we took the company private. Uh, and I'll hand it to Tony. Okay, thanks, Jay. And uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Tony Ratcliffe, CFO of uh, Source. I've been with, with the business uh, around about 18 months. My background is a UK chartered accountant, got an MBA as well. And I've spent my entire career, 20 plus years, in high growth uh, technology businesses with a real focus on building value. A uh, mixture, I think, of strategic operational transaction experience, uh, lots of M&A, and obviously quite a lot of experience on AIM as well. So hopefully pretty relevant to uh, what we're trying to do here. Uh, just a quick uh, H1 2021 results overview. We are a, for those not familiar with Source, we are a leading provider of uh, laboratory services to Blue Chip Pharma, NHS, and private hospitals uh, with four business units, uh, totaling $337 million in H1 of 2000. 21 versus 10.6 in 20. Uh, we've got infectious disease testing, which we'll talk more about uh, in the presentation, healthcare diagnostics, genomics, and a stability storage division. Uh, we have seen dramatic growth in profitability in the first half. Uh, adjusted EBITDA is up to 11.2, which is more than a sevenfold or almost a sevenfold uh, above the uh, uh, prior uh, H1 in 2020. Uh, strong trading in Q3 is uh, driven by record PCR volumes. In fact, even right now, we are seeing volumes that we have not seen previously in the entire uh, COVID pandemic. The change in travel rules announced on the 17th of September will reduce our volumes uh, in Q4, uh, but we have pivoted to lateral flow testing, which is, which is the new requirement for some of the travel, but we will still be offering PCR testing, and there is a market for that going forward. Uh, the main focus of, of uh, of me and also Tony and the management team is looking at M&A. We generated a lot of cash and we want to take the cash and look at uh, ways we can acquire businesses to underpin the growth of primarily the cellular pathology business and our ref lab business, which is more predictive and, and, and precision medicine. Uh, we've invested in our labs and equipment and people uh, and makes us well positioned for future organic growth. And we've got an expanding blue chip customer base, as you can see below. Uh, just some very brief corporate highlights. These are things that you'd expect us to be doing, but we have done them. So we did talk about increasing capacity from 10,000 we had in December to, uh, to 20,000 now. We have done that. In fact, we just completed 19,000 tests last week, and we're seeing you know, definitely higher volumes of testing uh, now than we've ever seen. Uh, we, did, uh, we are building that local services capability in our Rochdale storage uh, facility. Uh, we've got a micro sterility lab in Tremor, another storage facility to support the needs of our customers. Uh, we're expanding our San Diego labs to offer uh, not only COVID testing, but looking to do uh, NGS, text, uh, NGS testing uh, in, in, in 2022. We've recruited Nick Bills uh, as our director of healthcare, who's a former national pathology man manager for Nuffield Health uh, to lead our healthcare diagnostics group and also infectious disease testing business unit. Great addition to the team. It's been a, been a solid contributor to, to the business since he's joined us. Uh, continuing to operate our commercial approach, we're implementing a one source key account program to sell to big pharma in multiple locations at one time rather than individual sites. It's, it's an effective way to sell uh, lower cost of sale, higher value uh, uh, sale if you can sell across multiple locations. Uh, we are moving our Cambridge lab to a larger site within the science park uh, to expand our NGS and biopharma services into 2022. 
Okay, thanks, Jay. So uh, here I'm just going to give um, a quick sort of overview of the uh, financial summary. We're going to drill down but business unit by business unit shortly, but just that's all in terms of headline summary. Uh, as you can see, revenue uh, growth, very strong revenue growth, up 252% to 37.3 million. Uh, this is first half of 2020. Gross profit actually increased by the same percentage. So, you know, by definition, gross margins being maintained at 43%. Um, uh, first half versus half, first half of last year. And actually, importantly, it's gone up 3% from the 40% that we had in full year last year. So in terms of EBITDA, I guess the growth is even more dramatic, as Jay alluded to. Um, 11.2 million of EBITDA from 1.7 in the first half of 2020. And what that means in EBITDA percent profitability terms, um, essentially 30% EBITDA um, to return in the first half of this year, um, essentially double um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the amount, uh, sorry, the 16% amount of uh, first half 2020. And again, usefully, a couple of percentage points up on the full year 2020. That was actually 28% EBITDA percentage. Um, earnings per share, again, similar, similar sort of dramatic growth in, uh, sorry, in uh, earnings per share growth up to uh, 10.7 pence a share. It's actually a loss of 8 pence a share in the first half of 2020. And that 10.7 pence a pence is actually uh, around about double the full year 2020 earnings per share of uh, 5.3 pence. So as well as the strong earnings there that I think we've demonstrated, I, I think it's worth highlighting the cash generation and the strength of the balance sheet. I mean, real focus for us has absolutely been working capital management and working capital um, or cash conversion. And we'll talk some more about that uh, later, but um, clearly uh, cash generation from our operations here up uh, 700 plus percent up to 11.4 million. And importantly, this essentially is tracking above EBITDA, which was 11.2. Actually, if I go back and compare that to, to last year, um, full year 2020, um, the uh, cash generated from operations was 6.4 against an EBITDA of 14. So you can see we've actually tracked basically more than 100% of cash conversion. So that's really you know, massively um, helped support our balance sheet. So we've got a uh, uh, cash balance at the end of June of uh, 17 million, 17.2 million, more than double the level we had just six months before, 8.4. Uh, in fact, it's subsequently increased to uh, to 20 or actually more than 20 um, as of today. So very strong uh, balance sheet. Um, importantly, no debt on the balance sheet. So whilst we had borrowings of 100 plus million uh, the back end of 2020, that's all been taken care of uh, through the IPO and other transactions and supported by uh, strong trading and cash conversion since. So we feel absolutely strong balance sheet. Our focus is going to continue to be um, very strong direct um, working capital management. And that's really... Um, to support essentially the M&A activities. So we see essentially a war chest of, um, of funds that will help support M&A. And Jay is going to talk some more about that shortly. Okay, so let's talk infectious disease testing. Uh, just a quick overview. Business unit revenues are 28.4 million in H1 versus a full year, 34.5. Uh, we are a leading provider of COVID-19 PCR testing services, providing services to two major pharmacy chains in the UK, major travel and corporate partners, uh, as well as healthcare providers. Uh, I think it's important to note out that the recent changes in travel rules will reduce, there's no doubt about it, the, the need for PCR testing, but it will not negate the need for PCR testing. Uh, we are anticipating continued need for COVID-19 uh, testing in both short and longer term using multiple technology platforms. We've already pivoted into lateral flow. Uh, we you know, Obviously, that's, that's what's going to be used for travel uh, subsequent to PCR testing. We are positioned well with some of our large customers to offer them lateral flow devices. Whole genome sequencing of positive PCR results. We're, we're one of eight labs in the UK with this capability. And I think it's going to be important that as these smaller labs fall off uh, that aren't necessarily even accredited, we will consolidate our position within the market of, of what exists for PCR testing. So we're looking forward to seeing some growth there. Uh, we've got a rapid three-hour PCR uh, mobile platform up in Liverpool Airport. That may be wound down. Uh, Seroclear uh, is a quantitative antibody test from EKF. Uh, we've got it ready to go. If there's a demand uh, for anybody testing on a big scale, we will launch that product immediately. Uh, we are expecting to launch respiratory disease panels, which have flu type A, type B, RSV, and COVID, so that that may be the new sustainable business model where hospitals want to test for all four in one panel. We're positioning ourselves to be able to do that. Uh, and we're expanding our footprint into San Diego, uh, into the U.S. market via San Diego with an upgrade, planning to launch uh, uh, COVID testing in Q4. 
Okay, thanks, Jake. Okay, so just to summarise the financial um, profile really of the infectious disease testing business unit, you can see here, um, bottom left-hand uh, chart here, we've got really a chart of the average daily PCR test volumes. And it's that volume chart that is really has really driven the sort of financials for the for the period. And maybe I'll sort of step back a little bit and try and give you a flavour for why the profile is what it is. I mean, clearly back in 2020, um, you know, this all started in May. Uh, we were very much focused to build scale as fast as we possibly could in you know manageable increments, manageable steps. And uh, that's exactly what we did. Um, we were committed to build a capacity of about 10,500 tests a day by uh, the December year end. Again, we did that and, and succeeded. And you can see that we peaked at um, something like an average test um, volume of about, or throughput of about 7,200 tests a day. But in fact, we peaked at more than 9,000. So again, we absolutely needed that capacity of 10. Um, I think to be honest, um, at the time of the IPO, we imagined things, uh, things would sort of peak in the first half of 2021. So that sort of growth would continue and then it would sort of start to tail off. That was our view at that point, but clearly the landscape has moved around, uh, you know, uh, massively uh, in the meantime. At the end of 2020, early 2021, I think we recognised that obviously things were locked down, uh, travel was restricted, uh, PCR volumes um, were going to be lower, so we've had perhaps some more pedestrian um, H1 in terms of testing volumes, but what we did um, expect was that the phasing of our uh, 2021 revenues, earnings and cash generation would be very much be second half focus as travel started to get unlocked. Um, so we spent our time as well as delivering these kind of revenues and earnings in the first half, also building some scale up to 20,000 tests a day, ready for the unlocking of that travel, um, uh, you know, round about, uh, round about the summer. Um, and as you can see, um, as that did get unlocked, the, um, you know, the, 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 the the throughput of average PCR testing has dramatically grown uh, July, August, September. So to Jay's earlier point, we've had a bumper Q3, uh, which clearly isn't reflected in the first half um, earnings. So, I mean, in rough volume terms, we did about 750,000 tests last year, 2020. Q1, we've done about 300K tests. Uh, Q2, about 300K. Uh, give or take, for Q3, give or take, we think we'll be around about a million tests. And I think, again, reflecting the change in travel rules that were announced um, just a few days ago on the 17th, uh, you know, we, we are mo rather more modest in terms of the assumptions for Q4, but we still think there'll be material that may be around about 500,000 tests uh, or so. So that's the kind of the profile of the curve. I mean, in terms of the dynamics, I mean, the, the, this is really, you know, these numbers are driven really by, uh, you know, the, the PCR sort of pricing cost sort of profile. Last year, PCR tests were... You know, our average selling price was around about £40. We had a 40% gross margin. I think in the first half of 2021, we had very limited price pressure. Our average um, selling price was about £39. And um, we actually crept the gross margin up to 42% for the PCR piece of this business, which is most of it. Um, so clearly we had some benefits on, on uh, costs, on inputs, and that's fine. Um, but I think to be frank, we have seen far more pricing pressure in uh, in the third quarter, and obviously expect that to continue in the in the fourth quarter. So I think the dynamic does move to from pricing of thirty nine to forty pounds, perhaps um, historically, to closer to thirty or maybe slightly under thirty as an average. But clearly the range is wide, and um, we you know we have a, a wide range of clients. Um, but the gross margin will still be relatively robust. I think we're seeing that at about thirty five percent for um, for Q three, etc. So. A strong, um, strong set of earnings, and again, we've built this business in increments um, going forward. Uh, sorry, um, historically, um, and we'll obviously manage that process as we come, come, you know, down, down the curve. To Jay's point, it's worth saying that you know clearly we um, do have other offerings in our pipeline. We've got a San Diego facility looking to go online um, actually in the next month or so, uh, so that will be a contributor as well as our sort of mainstay UK lab. And we've got the lateral flow as well. So I think we'll see a mixed change as we go into Q4 um, and beyond. Good. Well, let's, talk, let's talk healthcare of diagnostics. And primarily, this means cellular pathology. Uh, business unit revenues at 2.4 definitely was impacted by COVID. We want to show you some uh, graphics later on the show. This business has bound, rebounded back very strongly. Uh, we are a leading cellular pathology partner to the NHS and private healthcare providers. Uh, we've created one of the largest consultant pathologist networks in the UK. And for those not familiar with Source, you can just take a look at the graphic on the on the right very quickly. You, so you get tissue samples sent. Uh, we get tissue samples sent to us from, 
private healthcare, NHS. Uh, we we process those samples, put them on slides, send those to our, our pathologists and our network. They then give us back their analysis. We provide a report, send it back to the NHS uh, and, and our private hospital. Uh, it's it's very much an outsourced service, but it's a highly skilled outsourced service, and we're one of the one of the better players in in the industry. We we tend to gravitate toward higher complex cases, which have higher uh, price points, and so we are we are gearing up for the return of uh, elective surgeries to to really underpin the growth of this business. Uh, I'll, I'll get into uh, the digital bit in a minute. One thing I wanted to mention is that prior to COVID, this business was growing at twenty four or sorry forty percent per year driven by a shortage of UK pathologists and the continuing trend to outsource pathology services, especially by private healthcare providers. Um, the, the growth opportunity remains uh, at that level, but now you've also got a return of scale of elective surgeries, which were put on hold. So we had been talking about the tsunami of work that was coming back. We can see that it's coming. It's In fact, the graph Tony is gonna show you, shows a significant growth in our business and we see that continuing uh, into the future. Uh, outsource pathology remains a fraction the 2.5 billion the NHS spends on pathology per year. So from our perspective, it's not really a market share game against other providers. It's getting the, the NHS and private hospitals to convert their work into outsourced uh, services. Uh, clearly, there's a national pressure to clear COVID-19 backlogs, uh, related uh, elective surgery backlogs. Uh, digital pathology is a system we have in place now validated being expanded and rolled out among our, our pathologists. Uh, it expands our bandwidth and redu reduces our turnaround time. So if you look at the graphic, uh, we won't be sending slides to our pathologists. And they won't be sending them back to us. So it takes days out of the turnaround time. It also increases our bandwidth because we can send digitized images to more pathologists, even potentially around the world, uh, to, to expand the scope of our service. Uh, we have a, a, a specialized diagnostic uh, testing uh, division or, or a small business unit that focuses on pre precision medicine. It's called Rev on Ref Lab. And there is a time with our genomics business as we get into more personalized medicine, and we're going to continue to focus on that. And one area of growth is private healthcare, especially in London. We have not been very effective at, at securing that market, and we're doing uh, uh, new uh, business development activities to secure more of that business uh, for us. This is just a very quick snapshot of, of the UK pathology reporting market share. Uh, we're a small piece of the overall pathology business, obviously. You can see our market share versus others in the pathology reporting. There are other areas we could get into within this space that would get us beyond just reporting. But even in reporting, you can see that it's fairly fragmented. But the biggest piece of the business is still not has not been outsourced. So that's an area of focus that we're going to be uh, focusing on, as I, as I said. Okay, thanks, Jay. So again, just to give a little bit of a financial profile to the healthcare piece. Um, so really, really, again, the focus here is very much on cellular pathology um, and the growth of cellular pathology. And it's perhaps, it's perhaps slightly lost in the numbers here, which is why we try to show you the graph on the right-hand side. But you know, cellular pathology is key for, key for this business unit, 70% plus of the, the overall business unit. I think Jay mentioned it, it's been growing historically 40% on an annual basis, um, certainly 40% growth, 17 to 18, 40%, 18 to 19. And in fact, the first, first quarter of uh, 2020, it was actually 80%, but then clearly COVID hit. And you can see that on the graph on the right-hand side where it kind of dives down. And, um, you know, to be frank, this is the business line that um, I guess took the longest to return back to normal levels of operation. So it's been very well publicized. The um, the extent of the uh, the waiting list backlog and you know the problems that's that's going to have and I guess here we you know the opportunity is that as that's coming back we're essentially reducing uh, those waiting lists and uh, and that, that's generating the growth so I mean what I will say is we left 2020 in December at a run rate of 166,000 in that month by um, by June 2021 it was 375k now that's more than doubled the run the run rate and actually just two months later in August. It was at 61. In other words, another sort of 50 60 percent up on June. So that's really the the shape of that graph as it's accelerating to grow, uh, accelerating the growth um, of the kind of level of business and the revenues that are coming back to us uh, through cell pathology. So you know we're very um, optimistic about the prospects of this going forward. Um, I did see an article actually last week. Uh, the public uh, Policy research suggested that the cancer treatment backlog could take something like uh, 10 or 11 years to clear um, up to 2033. Uh, and that was on, on the basis, I think, of throughput just increasing by 5% a year. But obviously, what we're seeing is far more uh, throughput than that. And I think that's our opportunity to, here to see some really dramatic 
revenue growth um, lines uh, going forward. In terms of gross margins, I mean, historically, this has been a 40% gross margin business. Clearly, in the periods that we're reflecting here, um, both sort of 2020 and the first half of 2021, we haven't, you know, been back to the, you know, full level of historic um, volume, never mind the sort of super volumes, if you like, that we see going forward. Um, so margins have been slightly reduced. You can see here 27, 28%. Um, we've mitigated to a degree. We've got our, our consultants are effectively pay as you go, um, you know, literally off balance sheet consultants, so that's fine. Um, to a degree, we've also um, utilised some of our own uh, full time staff from this division in, across into the COVID side, so, so that's helped that. So we have mitigated it where possible, but obviously, we do see this getting back to 40%, and in fact, going beyond 40% as we start to roll out to digital uh, going forward with all the sort of benefits that Joe described. Uh, let's talk genomics again. Genomics is a smaller business unit of ours. However, it is it is growing very well, especially on the next generation sequencing side. That's called NGS. There are two types of uh, uh, sequencing: Sanger sequencing and NGS. When you're sequencing a genome, that's definitely you're talking about NGS. Uh, in this business, outsource model is preferred for many pharma and biotech companies. Large pharma don't want their staff doing routine sequencing. They'd rather have them focusing on R and D. Smaller biotech companies don't have the the capital or the bandwidth to do some you know genome sequencing so they come to us so we've really got both sides of the market that we're targeting uh growth opportunities we're, we're moving our our site uh, in, in in cambridge to uh, a new facility larger facility in the cambridge science park great lo location to able to attract talent we can bring customers there it's, it's it's a great new facility uh the initial COVID equipment we bought that was lower volume we're now repurposing uh in, in cambridge uh, doing NGS uh, DNA extraction services uh, to expand our services offering uh, uh, from there. Uh, we're targeting increased demand from precision medicine. I did talk about that, and there's increasingly a bridge between genomics and a ref lab on, this, on the pathology side. Uh, we're, we're focusing more biopharma activities, which is more drug development, uh, and we are getting very active in that space. Uh, we've got a strong commercial sales team. I have to give them credit. They have come out and really changed the way we sell and sell higher uh, larger projects, higher volume, uh, and higher margin uh, 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 services. Uh, we're planning to offer NGS uh, services from our expanded San Diego uh, lab. And San Diego and Boston in the U.S. are the two centers of uh, genomics uh, research, so we're very well positioned to have an offering there. Okay, just a moment or two on the financials of the genomics business unit. Um, obviously, you can see here a strong growth, which we're delighted about in terms of revenue, up for 42%. Uh, period on period, uh, and also improvements on gross margin. So, so, so that, you know that's uh, all, all positive. I mean, clearly this is the business unit that uh, I think we've already reported has uh, really come back out of COVID the fastest. So we're delighted that this is uh, this is motoring on. I think the other point that is worth highlighting is is the kind of the mix really. Um, so we had identified back in 2019 strategically, we're much more interested in moving towards next generation sequencing the NGS projects. Um, rather than perhaps the more commodity Sanger sequencing. Uh, these projects, NGS projects, can be, um, should be higher value and higher margin uh, business. So that's very much a, a strategic shift. Let's try and get into that direction. We've got some investment in to make sure we could go that way. Pleased to see that um, in terms of proportion of the total genomics revenue, um, it's moved from 25% up to, uh, back in 2019, up to 33% in 2020, and it's now at 36%. So we are definitely trending towards uh, more NGS, and that's evident in the graph there, bar chart on the right-hand side. And I think the other thing is on the gross margin side. Um, so SANG sequence is, is trading happily at a 50% gross margin, and it's fine. Um, what we need to see is NGS tracking up as we secure these larger projects. So back in 2019, NGS had a gross margin of uh, of eight percent, which you know, completely unacceptable. Really, we increased that to twenty-one percent in uh, in calendar year twenty twenty, and it's now running at thirty-one percent. So it's absolutely trending north, which is the direction of travel we're keen to see. Um, but it should theoretically be over the fifty percent. So it's probably going to take a little bit of time to get there, but we're definitely tracking in that direction. Um, and uh, you know, again, this is a business that is um, it is already growing well. I think we need that capacity. In terms of the uh, Cambridge space that uh, that Jay talked about, um, and we've got a good pipeline to uh, to justify that uh, going forward. 
All right, so let's talk about stability storage. Um, I'm going to move these bullets around a bit. Stability storage data, for those not familiar with this business, is a regulatory requirement for pharmaceutical and consumer healthcare products as they're developed to make sure this, the compounds that are in the drugs are stable. And then once it's developed into a drug, you want to make sure the drug remains stable. And they need data in various different environmental conditions to, to mimic uh, conditions around the world. So we've got stability chambers that we can um, rent space in our facilities. Uh, we've got uh, manufactured equipment that we make ourselves and sell to companies that might want to have it in their facilities. And we also have a service and validation group that's, that supports the equipment that we have sold. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a nice business. It's recurring revenues. Uh, the storage business is uh, circa 80% gross margin. In fact, it's a bit higher than that. Um, it was impacted a bit during COVID uh, with restricting service visits and new equipment installations. Uh, but overall, this business is generally growing 8 to 10% a year. So it's a very solid uh, earner for the company. And again, the recurring revenue makes it nice. You can predict the revenues. Uh, typical storage contracts last three years with multiple studies from each client. So you've got a longer term uh, predictable revenue stream. Uh, areas of growth, uh, I think the recent investments we made in Ireland and uh, in San Diego have given us the ability to offer expanded environmental storage conditions. So if we want to get into medical device testing, it needs a different type of environmental condition than something else. So we are able to offer those extended services. Uh, we are building laboratory services offerings in Rochdale and Tremor, Ireland, where we will be able to test our customers' uh, products that they're storing with us as an analytical service, an additional service. It's something that we started prior to COVID. We kind of put it on hold during COVID, and we're bringing it back and making it happen. Uh, so nice business. Uh, like I said, recurring revenues. And Tony, I'll share with you some information uh, about that now. Okay, thanks, Jay. So again, uh, summary of this sort of uh, stability storage financials. Jay mentioned we've got three principal off, uh, offerings here. Storage is clearly the largest, most, most important to us. Uh, storage services, this is where clients are leaving their product in our facility. Um, that's about half the total revenue. Um, service and validation and manufacturing. So again, going back to the storage services, um, yeah, there's about half the, half the, um, the, the revenue. Very, very um, visible recurring revenue. So Jay mentioned three-year contracts. So this is recurring revenue. And again, highly profitable. And I think it's worth noting that the margin, the gross margin on this has actually tracked from 79% back in 19 up to 82% last year, 2020. And it's in fact uh, uh, been at 84% in the first half of this year. But I think it's worth saying that, yes, we did lose a little bit of business, that 3% delta um, year on year. And that was really where we moved our uh, US facility from uh, LA to San Diego. Um, where those clients or certain clients could not come to physically verify or validate rather that site. So there was a sort of one-off uh, COVID-related um, hit there. But clearly um, a solid, uh, very visible, highly recurring, highly profitable revenue stream. Service and validation, um, again, um, a good uh, gross margin business, typically about 50% of gross margin. Um, this has been relatively flat again, largely due to travel restrictions. But we've got, um, we've certainly got a, a growing install base um, for those guys to tackle. So we do see upside on that. Manufacturing is, is, is slightly odd. It's the smallest piece. Obviously, we're, we're essentially the service business. Um, so manufacturing is slightly unusual. It's a little bit lumpy. It's a capex sale, etc. Um, so we're kind of looking at you know creative ways of um, kind of minimising the sort of. Um, uh, gross margin dilution, if you like, from lower margins from that type of business. But overall, a very solid, visible uh, business uh, unit. Okay, so let's talk about acquisition plans and our focus uh, going forward. Yeah, I think it's important to keep in mind, we, we've talked a lot about infectious disease uh, prior to this presentation and also in this presentation. And we got into infectious disease as a hedge, knowing that the cellular pathology business was going to take a hit during COVID. We knew elective surgeries were going away, so we decided to pivot into infectious disease. It's been certainly more than just a hedge for us. It's, it's, it's paid itself uh, over eight times, 10 times. And, we, and it's already helped us build $20 million in cash. Uh, we're $20 million now, uh, plus more as forecast. And we've got working capital that we can ultimately unwind, which is probably put another five to $10 million on the cash balance creates a nice war chest for MA. And that is an area that, that I've been focusing on, Tony's been focusing on significantly over the past few months. Uh, we have potential for borrowing if we need to. We've got currently zero borrowings on the balance sheet, as Tony mentioned. Uh, we have engaged a buy side investment bank to scope approach and value uh, targets, and they're doing a, a very solid job of, of finding companies for us to take a look at. Focuses on expanding and accelerating cellular pathology and precision medicine. 
uh, really want to beef up our healthcare diagnostics business. Uh, this slide says UK, Ireland, US are our primary uh, areas of focus. I would say it's UK and the US primarily. Uh, digital pathology, private healthcare, uh, pathology service providers are some of the targets we're looking at. Clinical trials, healthcare diagnostic services business with new technologies or IP, uh, always attractive. Uh, we are currently in discussion with uh, multiple potential targets. Two of them are farther along. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, but this has been a key area of focus for the senior management team. And just to point out again, I know, you know, there's been a lot of talk about COVID and how that business is doing. We view this as, you know, we, we, we went into COVID, generated significant amounts of cash for us to buy companies to add on to our uh, organic business and, con and continue to grow via acquisition. And that's exactly what we're doing. Okay, thanks, Jay. So just a few seconds on the income statement. Again, you've seen this within the RNS. I'm not going to climb through it all. Uh, we've covered the revenue down to gross margin at each sort of business level stage. Right? One comment I might say overall on, on this, and that's about costs, it's actually cost base. So I think by definition, as we've built in a huge scale uh, in terms of COVID PCR testing, uh, we've had a significant number of people, around about 180 people, um, you know, at the bench to, to uh, deliver those uh, COVID tests. Um, so that's really lost in cost of sales. So clearly we're very mindful as we've built this this scale up in incremental uh, pieces over the last sort of year or more. Um, as we come down the other side, we very much have to sort of manage that uh, cost base as we come down the other side. And I think similarly, in terms of OPEX, I mean, it looks as though we've grown um, operating expenses 67%. Actually, I'd argue that uh, the growth actually on closing, uh, closing or exit to 2020 is about 40%, still way under obviously the revenue growth. Um, but clearly we've put additional um, headcounts in there. We've had uh, wage inflation, PLC, related costs, et cetera, et cetera. So again, we're very mindful of managing our cost base as we, as the kind of curve of our business uh, changes. So um, I think that's, that's a given an, an area of focus over the coming months. Um, I wasn't going to uh, drive through through the, the rest of the, the uh, numbers, but I'll take questions if there are any yet to come. Okay, in terms of the balance sheet, again, um, I'm not going to sort of go through too much detail here. Um, I mean, it's a relatively um, uh, straightforward balance sheet. I might say a couple of things on, uh, for example, fixed assets or CapEx. Uh, we spent about a million and a half this first half on CapEx, um, not a million miles away from the depreciation element of about 1.2. It's been really a mixture of um, laboratory fit out costs, um, actually UK and, and US uh, equipment as well. Uh, we've leased a few things too. And, you know, similarly last year, we've been a relatively modest level of CapEx. So, I mean, where we are with um, P, uh, with um, COVID or PCR-related CapEx is, well, frankly, the payback for all of that was, you know, measured in, in weeks. So that, that's a given. But I think it's also worth highlighting that essentially where we've got, well, we, where we, sorry, where we will have, um, based on our current thinking, surplus laboratory space in our PCR um, lab, um, it coincides quite nicely with the acceleration of our cell cellular pathology business. And so we very much plan to sort of redirect the physical uh, footprint of some of that uh, space over to cell pathology in the healthcare division. And I think in terms of the actual uh, equipment, quite a lot of the PCR-related equipment that we've purchased um, is actually very relevant for the genomics business. So again, as that business expands, it's um, it's got the ready-made sort of capex there to, to be used. So so I think it, it all kind of dovetails there quite quite neatly. Um, I mean, in terms of um, working capital, I mean, again, I think I've made made the point. We've been very focused on working capital. We've basically been pretty tight on uh, inventory. The inventory we had at the end of um, at the end of June represented about um, forty days of uh, forward uh, forward um, requirement. Uh, we've been, we've got longer on some of the more difficult to cons uh, difficult to procure items like uh, like tips, which typically are lower value, don't have a shelf life issue, etc. However, we've been much tighter in terms of the uh, call off, and I think we have been um, quite good in terms of managing call off schedules to quite difficult forecasts um, for some of the high value PCR tests, etc. So inventory has been tight. Receivables, we've got 10 million uh, of that 11.8 million of receivables and other debtors. 10 million is trade receivables. Um, we don't have a DHSC exposure. And again, we've been pretty good in terms of managing debtor days. We're at 43 average of the period versus 53 for last year. So again, all I would do is highlight working capital management is key for us. And you can see the, uh, the borrowings have disappeared. So for us, it's about building that uh, cash pile. 
and uh, using that to fuel growth of the business, partly organic, obviously partly inorganic, as Jace described. So just a, a brief summary and outlook. Uh, H1 was a period of significant growth for the business. We uh, exponentially expanded our operations and our revenues. Uh, EBITDA is up, uh, as I said, almost sevenfold over prior. Cash balance of 7.2 at the end of the half. It's more than double H1 with no borrowings. Infectious disease continues to create strong revenues, earnings, and cash generation, even though it's going to slow down uh, post, you know, once they implement these new travel restrictions, there will still be a, a infectious disease business that's going to be generating cash and earnings. Uh, it's established business. Our established businesses for outsourced pathology, uh, stability storage genomics have recovered from uh, COVID-19 and are, are moving into levels that we have not seen before. Uh, acquisition focuses on cellular pathology and healthcare diagnostics, as I mentioned, and it really underpins, for, for, for us, it's a lower risk strategy. We've already got businesses in the space. We can add on incremental customers. We can add on incremental capabilities. We know the customer base is selling more to the customers we already sell to. And when you put those those businesses together, the multiple of the business will, will increase and it'll grow our, our, our market cap. Uh, 2021 outlook, strong growth in revenue. We're looking at about a 70% increase in 2000. Uh, over 2020, and we're going to continue to build uh, cash balances for acquisition. That's absolutely fantastic. Jay, Tony, thank you very much indeed for your presentation. And ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. We should while the team take a few moments to review those investor questions submitted already. I'd like to remind you of the course. recording of the presentation along with a copy of the slides, we're available okay. via the Investor Meet company platform um, and we'll notify you once they're ready for your review. Okay. We'd also yes. like to remind you that your feedback is important to the company and immediately post the presentation, you'll be redirected to uh, give that feedback. Jay, Tony, we received a couple of pre-submitted questions. Perhaps we could start with these before we go into some of the live questions, if I may. Yeah. Um, sure. First one reads as follows. In four year 21, the bulk of revenue will come from the infectious diseases business, but the market seems to ascribe little value to this business. Roughly what percentage of Jay's time uh, is spent over the last nine months on the infectious disease business and what on the other three longer term businesses? Well, that's a that's an interesting question. I think I hope I answered some of that during the presentation today. Certainly, infectious disease. I think the market's valuing it at one times cash. Uh, however, it is generating significant amounts of cash that we want to use for acquisition. So, sir, I've been focusing on uh, 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 infectious disease, but certainly the other businesses I've been focusing on as well. In, in addition to really looking at potential M and A candidates. So it's not a it's not a twenty. Yeah, it's not a percentage of the revenues. It's a, it's a what's going to be best for the business growth longer term. And I do think look, focusing on cash from uh, the COVID business now, while we're on this, I would call it a melting ice cube, we need to maximize that so we can, you know, add more to our work chest for acquisitions. That's great. Thank you, Jay. The uh, second pre submitted question we have here is, should we assume that any future lateral flow technology testing revenues will be on the significantly lower margins in the PCR business of recent months? Again, I think you did cover some of this in the presentation, Jay. Yeah, but I mean, I think, you know, lateral flow is, is 33% margin. I think right now uh, PCR is... 39, something like that. So it's not that's not that different from a gross margin perspective. I will say that it's certainly not a the revenue profile is different. So you're not going to be seeing as much of a revenue uh, impact with uh, lateral flows you, we ha as we had done with uh, uh, PCR. Thank you very much indeed, Jay. If I may, guys, now just ask you just to click on that Q&A tab um, and where appropriate to do so. If you could just read out the question and give you a response, that'd be absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I can take that one, Tony. Yeah. If acquisitions are larger than cash, would we prefer to use des debt or equity to finance? I think there's a preference uh, to use debt, quite frankly. I think uh, with, our, with our share price weight is right now, I don't think I'd advise going into uh, equity. Uh, if that changes, certainly we can take a look at that. But we want to, I mean, I think we'll have enough cash to do a meaningful acquisition, even if there's a little bit of bank debt. Oops. I think we've covered this one. We've covered that one, right? Oops. I think I answered that one from Simon. So. Uh, base business, why is it recovering slower than forecasted? Well, remember when that note was put out at the beginning of COVID, we thought it was going to be a one blip up and it was going to go away with, with a, with a uh, vaccine. We've had several lockdowns. Um, you know, we've had a mini one even right now with uh, what's going on with, with, with the new variant, the Delta variant. So it's just, the businesses took a bit long to recover from COVID because COVID lasted a bit longer than we thought. 
think we've covered the last one. Okay. I think, guys, you, thanks for the comprehensive presentation. You covered them off in the in in, in the actual slide there, so that's well, that's wonderful. And of course, any further questions do come through. Yeah, there we go. One more, just come through if you want to grab that. Uh, are you seeing acquisition multiples still climbing? Uh, yes, multiples are still increasing across the board. Um, not just at companies we're looking at acquiring. And are there synergies if you buy a U.S. pathology business? Yes, there would be. Um, uh, there would be, and there'd be some potential uh, additional technologies we could bring into the UK from the US, because uh, there, there are areas of, of this business of the US is slightly ahead, we could bring them into the UK and be first to market. That's fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, guys. Um, Jay, if I may just ask you for a few final words just to give a snapshot of um, the business going forward. Thank you. Yeah, well, one, thanks for, for dialing in. Uh, we're, we're pretty proud of these results. It was a significant growth in the business uh, for H1. I think, you know, H2, we're going to deliver solid growth. And I think, again, the key thing is we've got a growing business, base business. We've got some cash generation we're going to be developing and looking to add on via acquisitions. That's absolutely fantastic. Jay Tony, thank you for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session? You should be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and is greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Source Bio International PLC, thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon. Thanks, everyone.